presence in this place tonight, God. And we thank you for the freedom that you've given us, God. Just thank you and praise you, Lord.
says, and you, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I've been just letting that spin around my head lately. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I've just been letting that sink in. For me, for healing, 
just other things in my life. Because there's something going on in our minds sometimes. Sometimes there's worry. Sometimes there's things going on. And when it comes down to it, if you're worrying about something, you're not free. Because you're not, get, you're not getting the truth. It's not sinking in. Because it says that you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we know that the Word of God says we don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to worry about anything. God's got it. He already knows. He's already got the solution for you. So that's what I've been meditating on lately and what, I, what I've been stirring on. And so from that, I've just been thanking God. Thank you, God, that you provided. Thank you, God, that you've healed. Thank you, God, that you've restored. Thank you, God, that you've refreshed there's ever a moment in our lives when we begin to question God or question His goodness, all that means is that we're not getting it. All that means is that we're missing it somewhere because God is good. He's so good. We just need to know the truth. We've been missing the truth somewhere. If God isn't perfect, if God isn't amazing, we're not full of joy. We're not full of trust. We're not full of hope. We've been missing it somewhere. But he said that you will know the truth, and it will set you free. So I just thank you that even in tonight, we're righteous not by our own goodness or by our works, but we're righteous just because he said so. Because we believed in Jesus Christ and he's forgiven us of, of all our sins. And so right now, because we're forgiven, we're completely pure right before God. And what a freedom that is. What a freedom that is. humans with gifts of the Spirit, and one of the things that he'll do is he'll just highlight situations or issues that people are dealing with so that we can pray, and so that you can know that God is interested about your issue, your situation, your problem that you're dealing with right now, and so I was just wondering, is there anybody here with that specifically has a herniated disc in their back? Okay, way in the back here, right on. Somebody came up and just said, I'd like you to stand up here and come on up. We're going to, um, 
I want you to just kind of work your way over this way, over by Miss Val. Okay? Is there anybody else as well? Because when God highlights those types of things, that means that there's an anointing to take care of the problem and the issue and, and really bring about healing. And so, uh, yeah, right over here. And if there's anybody else dealing with it as well, just come on up here. We're going to sing one more song. And if you even want to go back to this one, you can. It's up to you. No? You ready to move on? Yes, sir. Okay, last song. It's so the kids can get back to their party, too, because that's important, right? All right, let's sing.
just thank you for tonight, God. We thank you for your presence. And that we've been able to lay everything down before you, God. And just be stirred in your word. Be stirred in your spirit. And I thank you that as we continue service, God, you continue to refresh in us in your truth. That we can be set free more. God, your promises, we just give you the glory, in Jesus' name everybody said amen, amen, Woo. give it up, Woo. yes, Woo. Yeah. thank you Lord, mm. all right, give somebody a high five next to you, tell them they're looking good in the house tonight. All right, we are right in the middle of a technical breakdown. That's okay, though. So good to have you, everybody, here, weathering uh, the weather or the storm of the century, right? Or just kind of windy, blowy. But anyways, we're glad you're here, and uh, just pray that you get home safe, right? Anyways, uh, I wasn't prepared to do this, but yeah, here, let's just do this. On your table, there are programs that look like this. Please take the moment, look at what we're doing. We've got lots of great announcements on the front. On the back side, there's notes that you can follow along with the message. Also, there's also a welcome home card on your table. Look at, there we go, welcome, first time guests. Yeah, right there. Fill that out, and there's a basket right back by the offering box, and we will send you something really cool in the mail, all right? So please fill that out. And if you've been coming for a while, and you haven't filled one of these out yet, please do that, because it really helps us with... Uh, gathering your information so that we know how to, you know, get a hold of you and talk to you and uh, all those cool things because we send out emails and things like that at times uh, to let people know what's going on. All right, cool. Here at the house, we don't like to take an offering because we don't want to take anything from you, but what we'd like to do is give you the opportunity to partner with us in the area of finances. You know, it costs money to do with the things that we do, and uh, we just want you to have the opportunity to, like I said, partner with us, and so there's a black box in the back. There's also a giving kiosk as well if you, have, uh, if you give with your debit card or with a credit card. And it's real simple to, f to figure out. Just punch in the first time. Or, yeah, if, you know, sign in. Or if you've not signed in yet, you know, sign up as well. So, anyways, we're just going to cancel that part. Don't worry about it, guys, all right? I appreciate it. Uh, but each week we do like to take a moment and share out of the Word of God what it says about giving. And tonight, Spencer is going to share out of God's Word. So give it up for Spencer. Check, check. Hey, guys, how's it going? So I was given the opportunity to speak tonight. I was, at first, a little nervous. I'm not really a public speaker, but I was like, you know, this is God's thing, so I'll let him speak through me. So I have a couple verses here. First one is Luke 6. 38, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. The second verse I have is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So the point there is give and you will receive, and don't just give because you have to. Give because you want to. Be cheerful about it, you know? So I have a little story. I'll try to make it fast. I have a couple friends, and 
one of them, it's a husband and wife. The husband had cancer, and they're going through a lot of stuff, medical bills, whatnot. He's healed, though. Praise the Lord. Uh, they had a BMW, a car that they were trying to sell for a long time, and they weren't able to do anything with it. So they asked me, because they knew I had some expertise in cars and whatnot. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I can help you out with that. So I basically told them, you know, I'll cover the cost of parts and uh, fix it for you, and then once we get it sold, we can resolve that later. So about a week or two into it, I get all the parts, get all the money and everything. It's all done. And so I post it online to sell it, and we sell it just like a week later, you know, and a little over market value too. And I was just like, praise the Lord, you know. So with that said, I put about – Put some labor into it, about $250 worth of parts. So it was a little bit of a chunk of change. And I was doing it as a favor for a friend. I wasn't, wasn't looking for anything back. Just, you know, parts cost. That's it. So they come back to me after we get all the money and whatnot, and they're like, they hand me $500. I'm just like, what? No, I was just trying to get my parts cost back. That's it. But they, no, they just flat out gave me $500, and I was just like, awesome. You know, I put in the effort, I got back more than what I put in, and I, I was cheerful about it, you know? I didn't, not one minute, think, oh, man, i got to fix this car for this person, oh, crap. No, I, I was all cheerful about it. So my point is, be cheerful about giving, and you will get back. God takes care of you. And just a note, this was right before our youth mission trip to California, so it actually freed up bills for me and made me not worry about anything for that trip, so, you know, God's timing is perfect timing, right? So, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for everybody who's here and was unable to make it. Uh, thank you for your presence here, Lord. You know, thank you for this worship team, this amazing yeah. worship team, and I pray that you just speak through Mike tonight and just uh, open our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good job, Spencer. He just looks like a natural up here, doesn't he? That's pretty awesome. Okay, just a couple things as well. Welcome to everybody watching online as well. We're glad that you're hanging out there with us. So Utah, someone in Utah watching us. Hello from Utah, or hello from Vancouver to Utah. There we go. And down in Arizona, I know my mom's watching as well, and Probably uh, your, your brother was going to watch from up in Seattle area as well. So all over the country. <laughs> a lot of times uh, our friends in Florida as well will uh, be watching as well. So anyways, uh, just one other quick thing as well before I get into my jokes. Uh, we talked about sound system last week and uh, needing the new sound system. Our, our sound system, it, it was about a year and a half old. It wasn't old. Somehow it just like stopped working. And so we're going to check into getting it fixed. The problem with it is that it was already, we've like, our um, worship team kind of outgrew this sound system. And so we've been wanting to make a change, and we looked at one board, and it was like $3,500, and we're starting to raise some money towards it. But uh, we found another board that actually works better for us, and it's only $2,000. And so last week we talked about it, and we had a certain amount of money, I think about $1,000, kind of pledged towards it. Now uh, we have $1,800 pledged towards it. So what we need is another 200 to buy the board, and then there's taxes and shipping on that as well. So I'm thinking another couple hundred bucks on top of that as well. So another $400. And if you would be willing to help us, uh, even with just a small portion of that, just let me know. Please come up and tell me how much you're willing to do and then be faithful to follow up with that as well, you know. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, because it's one thing to say, hey, I'll do something, right? And then, uh, anyways, and so if you'd like to help us with that, please let us know. Let me know, and then that way when we have our goal met and the monies have come in, we can go purchase it, and uh, we won't have to use the old 1982 analog board that we're using right now that many times sounds like we're talking in a can. So anyways, uh, just encourage you guys to do that, all right? A couple of jokes here for you to get us kicked off. Taxi passenger tapped the driver 
on the shoulder to ask him a question. The driver screamed, lost control, nearly hit a bus, went up a footpath, and stopped centimeters from a shop window. For a second, the, everything went quiet. Then the driver said, look, sorry, pal, don't ever do that again. You scared the daylights out of me. The passenger apologized and said, I didn't realize the little tap on the shoulder would scare you so much. The driver responded, sorry, it's not really your fault. See, today's my first day as a cab driver. I've been driving a funeral van for 25 years. That was for you, Kathy. Yeah. All right, in the same kind of vein, at a mo motivational seminar, three men are asked to come up to the stage. They're all asked, when you're in your casket and friends and family are mourning upon you, what would you like to hear them say about you? The first guy said, well, I'd like to hear them say that I was a great doctor of my time and a great family man. The second man said, I'd like to hear them that I was a wonderful husband, a school teacher who made a huge difference in our children of tomorrow. The last guy replied, I'd like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> now, I, had to prom I, I promised you last week, you know, not every week is a, a stellar week of, of jokes. All right. Here we are. <laughs> Isn't it quiet? I know. I'm really enjoying it, though, so. See, okay, never mind, I'll just keep moving. All right. We're talking, we have a series called Maximized. Boing! There we go. And it's uh, all about maximizing your potential in life. Maximizing your potential. How many of you know that God wants you to be everything that he wants you to be in life, right? We all have potential. We all have an opportunity to be everything that God wants us to be in life. Not everybody quite makes it there. And it's really up to you whether or not you choose to go for it, right? And so we talked about this last week, what is potential? We talked about what the definition. It's possible as opposed to actual, capable of being or becoming, and also, uh, this is the one I really liked, a latent excellence or ability that may or may not be developed. A latent excellence or ability that may or may not be developed. And I talked about how people generally fall into one of three groups. The few who make things happen in life. The second is the many who watch things happen. And the third are the overwhelming majority who have no idea or notion of what just happened. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You know, you got those people that are the producers, and then you get the people that are kind of watching the producers. And those who watch are the envy of those who do. Hello? And then you have the people that just have no clue in life, right? And uh, it's so true. But God wants us all to be the producers. He wants us to be the type of people that are doing something with what he has for us to do. And we have a job, don't we? We talked about it last week. What is our job in the body of Christ? Make disciples. Ryan, you are so awesome. And by the way, if you haven't noticed yet, Ryan has got this cool beard thing going on. It's not just like fuzz. It's a baby M Preston's beard. All right, and it's pretty cool. I was just like, wow, you're a man. Yeah, water it daily. That's right. Put on spiritual plague music to help it grow. <laughs> and so I said last week as well, every person is either a creator of, of fact or a creature of circumstance. He either puts color into his environment or he's a chameleon, taking color from his environment. Who are you? Who are you? What? What area do you fall in, right? And then we talked as well, why do we need to improve in life? You know, it's one thing to, to say, hey, let's maximize our potential, but it's a whole other thing to say, well, why should I, right? And to answer those questions, right? And so we talked about the parable of the talents last week, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus knew that he'd go away, that he was going to return, and he gave us that job to do, to go make disciples, and so he, he gave $5,000 to one of his uh, people, one of his servants, and then he gave 2000 to another, and he gave 1000 to another. The first one went and doubled it, the second one went and doubled it, and the third one buried it. And when the master returned, the 5K and the 2K person became partners with God. He said, come and be my partners. Wouldn't you love to be partners with God? couple of you okay good all right 
But the 1K person that buried his talent, buried the opportunity that God gave him, Jesus said this, that's a terrible way to live. That's no way to live your life. And he was in big trouble because of it. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in big trouble. Do you? No. And so tonight, I want to take it another step. And, and so now we, we've talked about, you know, this opportunity that we have. But how can we begin to maximize who we are in God? How can we maximize our potential, right? And so I want to talk about maximizing your potential through focus. Through focus. I think of, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Karate Kid, the new one with Jackie Chan. He looked at uh, the little boy and says, your focus needs more focus. Is that bad? Is that a terrible Chinese impersonation? Your focus needs more focus. Yeah, it's bad, but all right. Anyways, what is focus? Focus is a central point as of attraction, attention, or activity. So you're focused. You're centrally focused. It's a central point targeted in and locked in on a certain thing. And, you know, I find this to be true that if you, whatever you focus on, like when I'm riding on my, my motorcycle, whatever I focus on is where my motorcycle goes. I've talked about that before. When you're going around a corner, you don't want to look off into the fields and things like that because your motorcycle will generally go wherever you look. And when we were taught and trained in, um, in driving your motorcycle safely, they always told you, matter of fact, I mean, they were ridiculous. Like, if you were supposed to turn over there, they wanted you to turn your head all the way to the side like that and almost look with this eye where you were going because they knew that if you got your head cranked over that way, the bike would generally go that way with you. Your focus is so important. And many Christians are not focused on the things that God wants for them to accomplish in their life. And that's why life just happens. Things happen over and over and over again. And they're just like, well, why, God? Why aren't you in this? Why is my life such a mess? Well, where's your focus? Where's your attention? Are you focused on the things that God has for you to do? Or are you focused on yourself? Are you focused on other things, right? This is good teaching. Psalms 119 verse 69 says, The godless spread lies about me, but I focus my attention on what you are saying. And isn't it true sometimes we have people say stuff about us or do stuff to us or, you know, things go on. And the really important thing is this. Don't pay attention to garbage that's going on around you. Stay focused on the thing that you have to do with God. God's got good stuff for us, right? Also in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, this is really important about focus. It says, all they have eyes for is the fashionable God of darkness. They think he can, he can give them what they want and what they won't, uh, excuse me, that they won't have to bother believing a truth they can't see. They're stone blind to the day spring brightness of the Messiah that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. This scripture is really cool. In another translation, it talks about that the God of this age has blinded those uh, eyes of non believers. It's blinded the eyes of non believers. It's so important for us to understand something. The enemy does not want you to see. He does not, like Preston was talking about, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's the last thing the enemy wants you to know. He wants to keep you from seeing the truth. And he'll keep your focus distracted. He'll get your fo focus muddy. He'll get your focus, you know, blurry. He'll get your focus uh, divided so that you don't see the truth and it's the truth that sets you free, right? And so it's really important for us to understand this. Christ is the one that gives us the best picture, the clear picture on how to live our life. To illustrate this tonight, I want to talk about three kings. Well, two kings and one who was going to be king. It's a guy named Saul, David, and Absalom. They were all leaders with potential, but they all had defects as well. Now, how many of you know you all have great potential? But we all have defects, don't we? So what's the deal? Minimize the defects, right? Accentuate the positives and grow, right? So to set up the story, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, this is all found in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, all right? They had been uh, led by prophets and judges, but they wanted a king. And so they went to Samuel, who was a prophet at that time, 
1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, it says, But when they said, God, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told them, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Everybody say, uh-oh. Yeah. So he goes to God. God directs him to a man named Saul, and he anoints him as king. Saul messes up, and David is then anointed king. Absalom is David's son, and he wants to be king, and he devises a scheme to cause a split of power. And so we have three things tonight that are going to help us understand about focus. The first one is this, blurred focus. Blurred focus. How many of you know uh, it's just a bummer to have to be looking at something with a blurred focus, right? Have you ever looked through binoculars and had it blurry or a camera and seen it blurry? You just can't see the clear picture, can you? With Saul, we see blurred focus. Saul had great potential. King Saul, he was, the Bible tells us that he was tall, that he was handsome, that he was a leader, and he was chosen by God. Wouldn't you love that? To be just like, you know, have all this great potential and then to have God say, hey, I choose you. You're going to be the leader. Okay, the people have rejected me, but you know what? They're still going to need a king. They're going to need a leader. And so that he gets chosen by God. But he also had insecurities. And so as a, a leader, he didn't listen to his leader that God had given him. How many of you know that whenever you are given an assignment that God will surround you with people to help you get that assignment accomplished. The Bible tells us that he gives us the gifts. He gives us, you know, uh, apostles. He gives us prophets. He gives us evangelists, teachers, pastors to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Those spiritual leaders in your life are there to help you be everything that you can be in life. Well, for him, for, for Saul, he had Samuel, the prophet of God, who could hear the voice of God. And we see this happen with his blurred vision. 1 Samuel 13, we tell us, it tells us that the Philistine army is attacking the Israelites. And Saul is leading the army, and they wait for Samuel the prophet to come and give them direction, but Samuel is delayed. How many times have you ever been through a situation where you're dealing with an issue or a problem and it seems like the answer's delayed? The problem is this. If you freak out and you try and figure it out on yourself, on your own, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. So true, isn't it? We all have been there. We own t-shirts, don't we, right? And so Samuel's delayed. So Saul chooses to offer up burnt offerings to the Lord instead of waiting on God's direction. And right in the middle of this process of setting up altars and slaughtering animals and trying to get God to speak to them, in walks Samuel. Really important lesson for us to learn is you need to do your job, not other people's jobs. Right? And so Samuel, he shows up, he sees the burnt offerings, and Saul's busted. And he asks him, what are you doing? And Saul says, I felt compelled because some were leaving. I felt compelled. You know, some people were taken off. And when you're doing God's work, you'll find this to be true. Some people leave. Some people take off. It just happens. And there's not much you can do about it. So Samuel tells him, because of your impatience, your family won't be on the throne of Israel for generation after generation. Bummer. He missed out on a huge blessing for him and his family, right? And then if you go down to 1 Samuel chapter 15, you see more of the story. Samuel gives Saul direction in battle to wipe out the Amalekites. They were in another battle against the Amalekites. And take and wipe out all of their possessions. And so if they have animals, wipe them out. Take it and get rid of it all. Wipe it out. Because they didn't want to bring upon them anything that would cause them to be pulled away from God. And so with the Amalekites, wipe it all out, right? That was the direction. And so as the battle goes on, Saul, the Israelites win the battle against the Amalekites. And they save some of the animals, some of the livestock. And also, say, the king of the Amalekites, he didn't kill him because he kind of liked him. So I was like, hey, you're an okay guy. I'm not going to kill you, right? So he keeps him alive. Here's the problem. 
Samuel comes in. <laughs> says, what are you doing? Why, why didn't you do what I told you to do? And Saul does the CYA, cover your behind, right? He starts to make excuses. He says, okay, well, the reason I did this was because I kept some of the animals because we were going to sacrifice them later. You know, this was going to be just some big, great party for God. That's what we were going to do. Yeah, that's what we were going to do. And Samuel looks at him and shares that really, really important verse in 1 Samuel 15. He says this, to obey is better than sacrifice. See, we can always go back to God, can't we, and say, God, I'm sorry, I blew it. We know that one, don't we? That's kind of our Christian trump card, right? It's like, an, oh, well, I, I can always go back to God and ask for forgiveness. But you know what God's heart is? God's heart is this, obey. It's better than going back and having to say you're sorry. And Samuel's checking it out. He sees the kings there, and he slaughters the king of the Amalekites. And because of that, the Bible says that God rejected Saul as king, and Samuel rejected Saul as king. And the anointing to do the job, anointing means nothing more than smeared on ability. Smeared on ability, that anointing lifted off of Saul, and things got really bad for him. And it was very difficult for him to lead as a king. Now, here's my point. When it comes to blurry vision, blurred vision, when you have blurred vision, it can allow your, the things that you believe in, your doctrines, your, the, the things the, that you know that God's telling you to do, and it can cause you to drop your morals and your ethics. And it can cause you to, keep, it keeps you from doing the things that you know you're supposed to do in life. So blurred vision's horrible. See, we want to get it clear. We want to get it focused. And how you do that is get into the word. Get into the truth, and the truth sets you free, right? Right on. Well, let's move on. Number two, another type of vision is this. It's distractions. And so David, if you know the story, he's the youngest of the sons of Jesse, and he becomes anointed by God by Samuel to become the king of Israel. But it was a process then after that. See, it's interesting. The ability, the smeared on power and ability to be the king of Israel was on David at a very young age. And what did he do with it? He used it to the best of his ability, even though the timing wasn't quite right yet because Saul was still king. And so what did he do with it? He went out and he, you know, he killed lions, he killed bears. He was a shepherd, boy, and he wrote all sorts of songs to the Lord. See, that's the best thing. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And maybe your timing isn't right yet, but guess what? It's coming. But use the most of what God has given you right now to do everything that you can for him. And that's what David was doing. And so he went and he served Saul. He became a captain in his army and he killed tens of thousands of people. Well, Saul killed thousands. It became a contention. And what did Saul do? Saul freaked out, right? Tried to kill him. Actually chased David down. A couple times he was in caves where David had the opportunity to kill Saul, but would not touch him. Would not touch him. He said, this God anointed this man. I am not going to touch that. Hmm. And so there he was, being chased by a king. Different times he had spears thrown at him while he was leading worship. <laughs> yeah, don't throw things at Preston. That would never be good, right? So Saul, and, and Saul dies in battle, and David is made king. And here's where the distraction comes in. It goes on to say that in the springtime, when kings lead their men into battle, David stayed home. Distractions come when you're not doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. You know, we tell you, pray every day. It'll help you. 
Read your Bible every day. It'll help you. It's like, well, I don't know. I'm kind of <sighs> going to get yourself in trouble. I guarantee you, every single time, distractions will come. And it happened for David. And so he stays home. He's on this rooftop outside, just hanging around. He sees a young lady bathing. He likes what he sees. <whistles> Brings her over, and he has sex with her. Sure enough, she gets pregnant. So David sends for her husband and tries to get him to sleep with her, but he won't do it. He wants to cover his tracks. He won't do it because his buddies are at war. So David has him killed. And when the prophet of God confronts David, David repents, but he loses the chance at building the temple of God, which would have been an amazing experience and feat for him. And he went through a lot of real difficulties as a direct result of it. Distractions keep you from being focused on the thing that God, want you to, God wants you to be. He keeps you. Distractions keep you from your God-given purpose. And it gets you off track. And I've seen this happen over and over again where a person gets excited about God and gets going for God and then all of a sudden a relationship happens or a distraction pops in and you know, and we have to be so very careful that when we start getting excited for God that the enemy can't slip in a distraction and keep you from being everything that God wants you to be in life. The third one is this, divided attention. And this is the story of Absalom. Absalom is not as popular of a story as King Saul or King David, but Absalom was David's son, and he was in line to be the king of Israel. He was next in line. David had served as the king for many years, and Absalom, as he was growing older, began to hang out by the city walls, by the gates. And that was the area where people would come because they had a beef with the king, and they wanted to talk to the king. And the king had to make rulings, and the rulings always didn't make the people happy that went to talk to the king. And Absalom, what he did was, he decided, you know what, I'm going to get in on some of this ruling stuff, and I'm just going to hear these people and what their issues are, what their problems are, and why the king won't help them. And so he started listening to them and the struggles and the, and the, and the beefs that they had with the king. And guess what happened? He picked up a fence. And he started to think, you know what? My dad, he's messed up. He can't do this right. I could do this so much better than him. I can. You know, up to me, I could, I could take care of this kingdom, deal with all these problems just like that. And before you know it, division takes place. Whenever you pick up a fence, you're picking up division. So like I said, Absalom begins to rally disgruntled people into his revolution, and he ends up dying an ugly, ugly death. You can look it up yourself. My point is this, is that God loves unity, and he hates division. He hates division. Matter of fact, it's the one thing that will stop the flowing of God's spirit. God wants us to have a free flowing of his spirit so that he can speak to us, so that he can minister to us and through us. An offense is nothing more than Satan's bait. He just dangles it out in front of us and says, hey, get ticked off of that mic. Gosh, what kind of preaching is he doing? Well, I've heard that one before. <laughs> wow. He's just stuck on the same old stuff. Well, that Preston, boy, that music's just so loud. What is that kid with the checkered pants doing up there? <laughs> He's just dancing around up there. What, who does he think he is? I'll tell you who you are. You're my son in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> you 
you know, there's going to be things that will rub you wrong with any church you go to. I don't care who you are, what it, you know. There are going to be things that happen. You know, there'll be a, something a leader says or does or doesn't do that really just rubs you wrong. You need to work it out if you can. And if you can't, move on. And when you move on, don't share your disagreement with others. By doing that, you stir up more dissension and you stop the moving of the Holy Spirit. And that's a terrible place to be. Divided attention. Divided focus. Distractions. And blurred focus. We can't be everything that God wants us to be by slipping into these things. We have to have sharp focus. Focused on the thing that God wants us to do. And at the house, we make it pretty simple. Build people. Build families. Build the community into a higher way of living. That's who we are. That's what we're about. That's what we're going to continue to do. We're not going to allow anything to distract us. Not going to get blurred on that. We're going to stay focused. And definitely, I don't want to get divided. Come on. Romans 12, we're going to finish with this. So here's what I want you to do. This is Paul speaking. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix, I can put it this way, focus your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. That's what God wants. That's what God has for us. We had an interesting thing happen today. We had a prayer meeting. Once a month, we have a special prayer meeting at the church to pray over. Just let the, it's to see what the Holy Spirit has to say. And if you'd like to be part of that at some point, just let me know and we'll invite you to the next one. But anyways, at first I just thought I was going nuts because it was just so bizarre. Here we are, we're in this prayer meeting and uh, there's just a few of us there and then uh, a couple more, uh, a family came in that wanted to pray with us as well. And in walks this person, this lady And she's wearing pajama pants and a big puffy jacket, and she's got a, like, a embroidered Bible, right? And she looks like she's maybe, like, 60 years old or something. I don't know. And she immediately starts talking to Candace and Kyle and saying, you know, uh, I'm not homeless. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to ask for anything. I'm just here. I go to this other church at times. You know, kind of. We didn't like. What, what did she say? Where, where? We didn't really quite catch that one. And then she said something so bizarre it just got us all kind of cracking up. I'm not even going to tell you what it is because it's just so far out there. And I, I started to pray and I started to laugh. I couldn't help it. And, but I didn't like, she didn't notice that I was laughing about her because that would be horrible, right? And we just started praying. Val started just praying in the spirit, you know, just praying in tongues, just praying, praying, praying. About five minutes later, she gets up and she grabs her stuff and she walks back out. I said, well, have a nice day. Hope to see you soon. She goes out the door, and she's gone. I mean, gone. And uh, we were just like, what just happened? 
And literally, we all began to laugh. And we laughed and we laughed and we laughed for almost a half an hour straight. Now, understand what I'm trying to say here. I'm not, I'm not saying that we laughed at the person because it was, it was just so bizarre. And if you know what our families deal with when it comes to pressures of ministry, sometimes you just get so weighed down by the pressures of ministry that it's just heavy and you need that influx that shot of joy that life can sometimes send your way and we began talking about it a little bit it's like well I really think that God sent this person to us and the more I prayed about it and as I was worshiping God here tonight I almost feel like maybe this was an angel in disguise to help redirect us, help refocus us on the most important things. See, the Bible tells us that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that that's God's kingdom. It's not hanging out just with your head down, pushed down into the ground by the weight of life. It's not about, you know, just, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now, God? Uh, uh, uh. But it's to know that He is God, and that He is good, and that He loves you, and that He loves me, and that He's got a great plan, and that He's got it under control, that we can laugh in any circumstance, because it's God's will for us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So I really felt like we got a a good shot, a dose of redirection of focus today. And my encouragement to you tonight, my my hope for you tonight is this. If you're dealing with blurred focus, if you're dealing with a distracted focus, if you're dealing with a divided focus, get back on the right track. Let the Holy Spirit get you back on the right track. You may not have an angel here. (laughs) But he's here. He's here. And he'll get you going in the right direction if you'll let him. So I'd like the worship team to come. That one song was so cool. That new one that you did tonight. Can you guys do that one again? Maya, you're so awesome. Look at you. She's so amazing. Isn't she playing the keyboards for Jesus? If you watch her too, I just, I, I, I just dig watching her because she sings right along as she's worshiping. Love it. Really proud of you, Maya. Anyways, why don't you stand to your feet for a minute? Hello. you're here tonight and you're not sure you have a right relationship with God, maybe you have been so distracted, so blurred, so wiped out in your vision that it's almost like you're blinded and you'd like to get back on the right track. The Bible says it's the truth of God's word that sets you free. So everyone bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute. If you want me to pray with you about that, help you get going on the right track, Just raise your hand with me and I'll pray with you about it. Is there anybody here? Thank you. Sure. A couple hands, three hands. That's awesome. Let's put it up, put it back down again. Anybody else as well? Just looking around real quick. I want to lead you all in a prayer and I want you to just repeat it out loud with me. Uh, This is a good prayer. It's a good prayer for you. Even if you didn't raise your hand, just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. We come to you tonight. Our vision needs clarity. Help clear things up. We need your help. You are the truth, and your truth sets us free. Holy Spirit, come into my life. I'm ready to change. 
I'm ready to grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're well on your way to getting on the right track with God. Well, let's sing this song. Let's worship the Lord one more time, and then we'll wrap up the service tonight.
just thank you for the night, God. Thank you for your word. We just worship you. We give you all our praise, God. Just thank you. If you need prayer for anything, I, don't, I want to invite you on up. Worship team's going to continue to play. If you got to go, we love you. If you've got kids, I want to go ahead and dismiss you to go ahead and get your kids. Uh, but worship team's going to go ahead and continue to play. If you need prayer, go ahead and come on up. Because prayer is powerful. God answers. Because he's good.
thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. And we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So weird. 